uh, I'm really fascinated by the session, so I'm going to sit at the back and listen in as well. Uh, so I hope you really enjoy it, and I'm going to hand over to Morris from DOCO to introduce the panel. Yep. We are... Um we're actually one person shy at the moment. We're waiting for one other person to arrive. So when he does arrive, I want you to make him feel awkward and embarrassed and give him a round of applause as he makes that awkward walk of shame down the middle there. Um, so yeah, we're just waiting for one other person, um, um, Chris. Actually, I just want to get a, a flavour of who's here. I wonder if we could do a quick show of hands. Who's here from the agency world? Kind of social media, marketing, advertising. OK. Who's here from kind of the client side of things? So. Um, those who are kind of purchasing of social media, if you like. Uh, and then who are the, are there any, have, we got, have we got any teens? <laughs> no, Sam, you're not quite, <laughs> quite in there. But we do have one genuine teen at the back there. We might ask you to make sure that we're not talking rubbish. Um, my name is Morris Wheeler. I'm the Strategic Planning Director at DOCO. Uh, we're an integrated marketing agency. You may know our previous name before we rebranded. We were Digital Outlook. Um, we've done a lot of work in the youth and the family and the, and the teen space. Uh, we do work with Tesco's, we do work with Procter & Gamble, we do work with um, Lego, we do work with Xbox. Um, we do work with uh, uh, lots of great clients in that kind of youth space and, and really we, we cut our teeth in social, if you like, on music acts. We're responsible for launching uh, Busted um, and uh, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> as well as um, working on bands like U2 and Eminem and slightly bigger ones than, than, than Busted as well. Um, we're here today to talk about teens. Um, and actually, it was interesting. Sam kind of came to us with this proposition of teens. Um, and, they're, and they're very fascinating um, species, if you like. And, and obviously, the, 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 the session is called Teenage of the Species. And the reason why we went down that is because the teenage brain is very different from, from other people's brains. And I actually have. I've always wanted a foam brain, and uh, now I have the opportunity to own one just for this very purpose. But the teen brain is actually different um, from normal adult brains. This is the brain here. Um, because the frontal lobe isn't actually as developed within teens as it is within adults. Um, so actually, for a long, long time, we used to think that it was up until about the age of 10, and that was where your brain was fully developed. And the reason why teens were a bit different was just because they were all washed with hormones. But that's not actually the case. Actually, their brain isn't fully developed, as I say, in that frontal lobe area. And that frontal lobe area is what's responsible for judgment, insights, dampening of emotion, and impulse control. So you kind of see why you get so many kind of irrational, headstrong, risk-taking, um, emotional teenagers. And that's because, actually, it's not just because of the hormones. Obviously, that, that plays a part. But it's because their brain is actually fundamentally different. There's actually some, some interesting research uh, as well looking at um, as teenagers, uh, obviously, of today grew up I exclusively in the world of electronic media, um, their brains are actually wired slightly differently from um, brains of other people because the way that they've processed stuff is different. So they did some research recently where they took some 50-year-old women and they asked them to, they put them in an fMRI um, scanner and they asked them to Google um, some stuff. And the bit of brain that lit up for 50-year-old women was very different from the bit of brain that lit up for teenagers. So actually, the way that they process stuff, the way they um, control stuff, and, and actually the whole brain is very different, which means that um, as clients and as marketeers and as all the people here who want to understand teens, we need to realize that they are very different species, if you like, and therefore we need to treat them very differently and not just treat them as young adults or even just hormonal adults. We need to kind of approach them and, and talk to them and engage with them in a, in a different way. So hopefully, um, that's what we're going to cover today. We're going to give you an overview of, of who these teens are. We're going to talk to you about how people have successfully marketed to them, how people have successfully created products and services for them. Um, as Sam said, very, very interactive session. Throw in questions as and when you want. Um, there's a microphone, so if you could kind of stick your hand up and wait for the mic to get to you, um, just because we're recording this and it's also webcasting, so we want to make sure that everyone can hear what you're saying. Um, but please throw out the questions um, as and when you want to. Um, we have two members, but I think the third is here. And the third is here. Um, first of all, we've got Dr. Barbie Clark, um, who did her PhD uh, in child and adolescent psychosocial development uh, at Cambridge. So pretty well um, uh, qualified to talk about adolescents and teens. Um, after doing her um, PhD, she then moved on into the world of research, uh, worked for GFK NOP, uh, and then set up our own business um, called Family, Kids and Youth. 
Um, we have uh, Mark, Mark Kindle, um, from Nokia. A UK communications and media person from, from Nokia, um, an ever-evolving job title, he tells me. Um, but uh, Mark was responsible for, and here is Chris, everyone, if we can give Chris. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mark is, is, uh, is from Nokia, responsible for um, an initiative last year, um, the Conspiracy for Good, and also um, did the launch of the um, new Nokia phone with a big light projection thing that he's going to talk about uh, in a minute, but obviously social media being very high on his agenda. And last but not least, um, as if perfectly timed, uh, Chris Ward. Um, and Chris comes from Blue Dot. I'm not going to talk too much about Blue Dot because I think um, Chris is going to cover that. Um, but before Blue Dot, we worked for One Goal, which was a FIFA World Cup legacy initiative about educating and, aware, uh, and awareness and uh, raising money for um, education in developing countries. Before that was the uh, Creative Communications Director for uh, Comet Relief, and then previous to that, many other existences and many other roles. Um, so hopefully between um, the three of them, they should be able to cover all the questions that you have, but please um, fire them through. Without further ado, um, is it without further ado, are we ready? No, not quite. <laughs> um, but first of all, it's going to be um, Barbie who's going to talk to us um, about teenagers and what makes them different. Uh, and we're just going to load on um, Chris's video. Anyone know any good songs? So really now, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Barbie. And um, it's great to be here. I love events like this. Um, and um, I'm clearly not a teenager. So I, this morning, woke up and thought, how am I going to talk to a room full of people about teenagers when we haven't, and I, I'm so pleased that we've got a teenager, well done, <laughs> um, here, because, um, as Morris said, teenagers are, are different. Um, and I think we can also get confused and think they're perhaps a little bit more different than they actually are, that they're some alien animal. And of course, we have all been teenagers, and for some of you, it would be easier to remember than others what it was like. And many times when I talk to people about what they felt like as teenagers, it's kind of quite a, quite a painful uh, memory, kind of difficult, awkward. And I guess that's the feeling that we have with teenagers. So when we're thinking about marketing to them or working with them or helping them, it always feels like it's out there. It's not something that we can immediately embrace. So um, I'm going to take you through um, just a little bit of what um, we've done. And I was thinking, well, actually, what have we done and what are we doing? And at the moment, um, our agency does um, research with um, children and with teenagers and with all the people around them, so like teachers and parents and carers and, and all sorts of people like that. Um, and at the moment, we've got, I think, about 10 or 12 projects on. And I worked out that of those, eight are specifically about the way in which basically uh, teenagers are, are communicating with each other through digital. Um, two of them are specifically about website designs. Um, and one is about um, the design of a Facebook page that's designed specifically for um, teenagers. And the others, which I think is probably the area that is most interesting to you, is really about behavior. How do teenagers behave when they're online, you know, rather than when they're just together? And I think that's the sort of area that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to throw, I haven't got millions. I only put this together this morning. Um, so I haven't got lots of them. And I can't quite remember what I put together, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to talk over it. Um, but I think. Um, Basically, I want to just sort of talk about that sort of behaviour. Now, please don't feel I'm giving you a lecture and do interrupt and shout or whatever, disagree with me, ask questions, um, because I think that's the sort of session you want, really, to have it really, really interactive. 
Um, it's half term this week, as you know, and I think we sometimes forget that actually teenagers, most teenagers, until they get right to the top end, um, are at school. So it's, it's quite a big time. My um, assistant, um, Julia, at work has two teenage children, and she came in looking absolutely exhausted yesterday. And I said, are you okay, Julia? And she said, would you believe that teenagers have a party on a Monday night? And of course, it is, it is half term. And her daughter had come in at four in the morning with her friends um, because they'd been partying. She'd been texting her and trying to phone her all night and couldn't get hold of her because, because, I don't know. And it was kind of, it was too difficult for them to actually explain where they were, what they'd been doing. Um, so you get a very anxious mother, who's a pretty good mother, I have to say, but very, very anxious. And this teenager who'd come in at four in the morning without telling mum where she'd been or where she was. And that kind of anxiety is probably the conflict that, that characterises, I think, young people. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and I think um, I'll kind of try and explain a little bit about what that, what that is. I mean, actually, if I was talking to you about teenagers and child development, I'd be here all day, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I'm going to sort of just touch on a, on, on a few things, just to kind of really put the foundation of, of, of this discussion um, for you. So half term this week, we're carrying out some research, some um, quantitative research with 1,000 um, 11 to 16 year olds this week um, about their digital engagement, what they're doing online, and actually um, how they respond. We're specifically looking at ways in which they find information, but particularly find information that's going to help them, how they look for helplines, that sort of thing. Um, now, we have done loads and loads of work on um, social networking, social communication with teenagers. And we first started in 2006, so six years ago now, um, looking at social networking and children and young people. And we looked at teenagers, as you can imagine, we sort of started, we, we, we did start actually at 11 and we thought, oh, that's very young, you know, to start looking at social networking sites. Um, and at that point, um, they were all on things like, uh, I remember Pixo coming up really, really highly and they just loved posting their pictures on it. And then, you know, when we back, went back to see them again, because we saw the same children, we went to see them over two years actually, and we went back every, every three months, we went back and spent half a day with these, with these young people so we got to know them quite well and, and actually observed their, 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 um, their development obviously. Um, so the next time we went back they, none of them, they'd all sort of forgotten about Pixo and they were on Bebo, the next time it was MySpace and then we'd go back again and they'd say oh no one uses MySpace anymore, everybody's on Facebook and, and that was the kind of, that was the progress and we, we all know that. Um, now, of course, at the moment, um, we're, we're actually going younger and younger with um, social networking. Um, and the latest research from the EU Kids Online research, um, which I'm sure you all know about LSE, Sonia Livingstone, um, showed that 30%, so nearly a third of 9 to 11 year olds, um, use a social networking site. But we're not talking about that, we're talking about teenagers. And I just want to talk about adolescents and. and, and um, Morris did actually touch on that and talked about the, 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 the development of the brain. And all the time, more and more research, a lot of research actually done at Cambridge, um, at the Faculty of Education where I, where I lecture part time, being done on the evolution, if you like, of, of the teen brain. And the thinking really about adolescence is that the brain isn't fully functioning and fully developed until around somewhere between 21 and 25. So those of you who aren't quite 25 yet, you know, you're still developing. And there's a reason for everything. And actually, if you look, those of you who are over 25 and you look back to the things you did when you were under 25, um, well, that's why. It wasn't, hadn't quite, quite all developed. And the whole age of puberty is, 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 is very interesting. So the average age of puberty is 11 for girls, um, 12 for boys, but it can be anywhere in between the age of 8 and 13 for girls and 9 and 14 for boys. So kind of, you know, a big, big age group. So in a way, childhood doesn't, doesn't last that long. And if we think about teenagers, um, teenagers can develop, of course they can, at, at di different ages. And this conflict, I think, with parents where suddenly it seems to happen very quickly for a parent where a child is sort of quite sweet and gets up very early in the morning and suddenly they wake up and there's this 
child who won't get up in the morning, and everything is a conflict. Um, so there's a huge kind of social um, time of transition during adolescence. It's a time when, of course, um, kids are, go to secondary school all over the world. They, they make that transition into, into high school or whatever it's called. In the UK, it's called secondary schools. Um, and it's a time when there's a lot of, of course, physical changes, hormones, um, but also physical development as well. It's also an age when they reach um, social competence. And social competence is an incredibly important thing to have because it's the ability to accurately send and receive emotional uh, messages. Um, have the ability to learn from others, to read others, to read, take another's perspective, and actually to manage behavior as well, and, and, and to, I suppose, to work cooperatively with others. Now, some would argue that some people never actually reach that stage, but certainly it's never reached until the point of um, adolescence, and it's a continuing, continu continuing process all the way through right up into early 20s where that ability to really understand. And that has all sorts of implications, I think, when we're thinking about how we communicate with um, young people. Because perhaps they don't always get it, and perhaps it's not their fault. Um, it's an age, of course, as we all know, when friends become much more important than adults. And this is, again, very difficult for all the adults around um, teenagers. Um, and peer influence is actually at its peak in early adolescence, and early adolescence is, is the age 10 to 14. It's very interesting that that's when the, the, when the most influence on, of, of peers um, is, is at its top. After that age, um, it tends to be much more um, young people finding their own way, kind of thinking who they are, and perhaps doing things a little bit differently from their friends. So it's a slightly different sort of, um, a, a slightly different, um, I suppose, emphasis on, on kind of who you believe and who you listen to. So after 14, they tend to have a slightly more sense of um, autonomy. Um, but they do experiment, of course they do, and peer pressure can certainly lead to untypical behavior, and it's very much how, com how confident that young person is, how much self-esteem they have, um, and that will do, have a lot to do with the way in which um, their early childhood experience has, has kind of settled them and, and how much confidence they have um, to be themselves. They're very much fitting in, they're very much doing what their parents say they want to do. Um, and so that kind of whole questioning that goes on, how do I fit in the world, who am I, um, beginning to experiment with looks, going through maybe different um, phases. I mean, we go back to children and one time they're an emo and you go back again and they become a goth and they, you don't recognize them. You know, that sort of sense of changing, changing, changing um, always, always happens. And in a funny sort of way, I think this age isn't actually, um, that there is no real sense of saying, hey, you know, you have become, there's no celebratory, celebration really other than perhaps um, in um, the Jewish faith of bar mitzvahs, where it's saying, yes, yes, you know, you've reached this point of adolescence. There is no real sense, but there should be, because it is a very exciting um, age. Um, and I think um, that kind of trying to find an identity is, is actually so important, is it? And do we, ever, do we ever achieve it, I wonder? But certainly during that period of, of, of teenage years, um, that really trying to search um, who they are is, is so key. Um, so, okay, what's this got to do with digital interaction? Well, absolutely everything, obviously, because all these processes that go on and always have gone on, I mean, you all had it when you were teenagers as well, um, finding an identity, um, think, listening to peers, thinking about what others are doing, experimenting, um, exploring different types of worlds is absolutely being played out, of course, through social, social networking. So just to give you a very you know, quick example, um, I've found kids in my um, research who have been, for instance, bullied. And they will go on to things like the World of Warcraft 
and they will kill everyone. You know, they are winning because that's their way of playing out this process that's happening to them of, of being bullied. Equally, um, I've come across girls who have quite a problem with their body image. Maybe they're a little bit overweight. Um, and they'll go on to um, websites and adopt an avatar where they're much slimmer. Not unlike the way they look now. They often have the same color hair, for instance, and the same color eyes, but they're much slimmer and taller and a more attractive version, as they see it, of themselves. So that ability to play out kind of who they want to be and who they are is very much obviously going on um, through, through um, the internet and through social networking. Um, the use of avatars, I think, can really help that process and can really help them explore their identity. And that's actually what they want to do. They want to play around and they want to um, interact with each other. So an awful lot of the interaction that goes on is through game sites. Um, and I think we need to get rid of this image that um, we're often given of young people being um, kind of shut away in their bedrooms on their own, uh, just on the internet. And, and, and those are the sort of images that everyone gets very worried about. In fact, when they're playing games, it's usually pre-booked. And you know, they've arranged to make, meet, meet their friends. So in, in, again, in some of the research I did, um, there was a young 13-year-old um, who'd moved um, from the UK to Portugal with his family. And he didn't even speak Portuguese. He was really worried about his pro this, this process. And his friends, his mates, were very, very supportive. And they arranged to meet him every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday um, online through the world of Warcraft um, and actually played a game with him for an hour. Now, that was so supportive for this boy because he was actually able to keep communication. And I think if um, a young person, uh, you know, like 10, even 20 years ago, if they'd moved, those kids wouldn't really have kept in touch with each other unless they kept writing letters to each other. You know, it, the, all contact would have been lost. But they really are keeping, um, keeping contact with each other. Um, so they play around with their gender, they can play around with how they look, they can play around with who they are, and that's very much what's going on. And of course, posting everything that you are and who you are online has very much been a characteristic of, of teenagers' use of social networking sites. Um, and we've come across you know, many teenagers who have at least a thousand friends um, on um, Facebook. Of course, they don't know who they are. And also, they um, are very much able to um, put up that, this kind of running commentary of what they're doing and, and where they're going. Now, that was, I have to say, about two years ago. And our me most recent research has actually found some very interesting differences in that. Um, I suppose the first thing, and probably the first reason, is the multiple devices they're now using. So um, it's no longer just the PC or the laptop. It's actually um, uh, many, many of them have tablets. Many of the teenagers that we're talking to now have um, tablets. And they've bought them, and we're talking obviously about fairly well-off teenagers, but nevertheless, many, many of them have them. And where they can't take their smartphone into school or their mobile phone into school because schools are often banning them, they are taking their tablets. Um, and if they haven't got a tablet, many, many, many of them um, have iPod touches. So they're still doing the same process that they would have done. Um, they're still connecting with each other. FaceTime, particularly, is huge at the moment. So many, many of them are FaceTiming. Um, they're playing, of course, and getting on the internet through the various game sites, so Xbox, PS3, Wii, etc., etc. Um, BlackBerry, um, as I'm sure you know all this, but BlackBerry has been massive in the teenage market, and that's because of BlackBerry messaging. <coughs> they've all loved it. And funnily enough, they've gone to BlackBerry and not iPhones. I mean, if you were BlackBerry here, if there's anyone from BlackBerry, they'd say, well, of course they would. But it is because of the messaging um, that they've got. And, and that still sort of seems to be a characteristic, and they seem to sort of ask for a new BlackBerry whenever they can get away with it. So they're updating the BlackBerry as well. Um, and uh, this is kind of a quote, very typical of a teenager. This was a 14-year-old boy. I'm on the internet pretty much 24-7. I'm always connected. Um, it's nothing new. It's they're doing exactly, exactly what the rest of us are doing. So um, 
I think it's quite interesting to um, just look at um, Twitter as well. Twitter um, was first sort of around, that I was aware of really in about 2007, I think. Um, and I was speaking at um, the Cambridge um, Festival of Ideas and I was talking about kids and social networking and every, people were talking about Twitter and this thing Twitter um, took off and it was quite a sort of grown up thing, adult thing, wasn't it? And teenagers have only just really begun to adopt that. And what we're finding, which I think is really interesting, is that Facebook is actually dropping off. So the older teenagers are still using Facebook in pretty well the same way they've always used it. But younger teenagers, and the main characteristic of a teenager, of course, is that you've got to be different. So if you're 13, you do not want to do what your 16-year-old brother is doing. Your 16-year-old brother's a bit sad because he's, you know, 16, 17, and he's actually still on Facebook. So what they're now doing is adopting um, Twitter. And they like it um, because it actually still fulfills that social need um, to keep close to friends, which is what they're doing. They're communi communicating with their friends. But it also has that element of anonymity. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this was kind of just a quote. I was really annoyed with my brother. Um, and really upset, and I put out a tweet, and lots of people responded. It really helped me. So they're actually kind of playing out their emotions through, through tweeting as well. Now, I could go on forever, um, and I'm sure you're very tired of the sound of my voice. Um, so I'm going to end there, but obviously we'll go on and we'll talk, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Bobby. Uh, now over to, to Mark. Let me load up your... Um, I haven't got a presentation. I haven't got a trusted post-it note, so I do apologise if you've got to look at the new phone, but I'm obviously my job is to sell the phone, so... I pray that I actually had quite a funny uh, teenage experience yesterday coming to talk about teenage today. I went to Waitrose to buy a bottle of wine to go to my dinner and they wouldn't serve me because I didn't have ID on me. So I thought the time was quite strange. I was very proud and straight on Twitter and Facebook to you know tell my friends that I look allegedly 18 when I'm 29. So anyway, uh, I'll kick on. I'm obviously no expert, but I'll give my opinions on how I feel the sort of teenage brain works and how we as Nokia are, are kind of doing our best to get into the mindset and convince teens that we're a, a cool, incredible brand. I think if you look at yourself and the way you develop, I think from the age of 13, that's the kind of first milestone as being a teenager. 16 is probably the next one, and then 18, 19, you're actually a very different person at each of those age groups. You know, maybe the foundations of your soul will be there, but actually your interests, how confident you are, and how you develop, grow, and kind of learn your social skills really happens through those ages. I think I was probably part of that generation that grew up with a TV remote and the internet as a teenager, but actually the majority of your social interaction really happened with your mates, either on the football pitch or wherever. We couldn't go on a social network to really talk to each other. And I think if you look at the kind of generation behind mine, the current generation, they are the first that have really grown up with that ability to avoid those embarrassing moments like asking a girl out or whatever it might be when you're 13, 14, 15. And actually you've kind of got a channel that can I guess you can skip certain elements of you know engagement that really do build who you are later so I, I you know I'm not the expert to say how that will affect people but you know I think it's something that you can't really ignore so I think you know if I look at my nephew who's really young I see what he does on Facebook and he's a, an early teenager and he he tends to spend more time playing on games so every time I see a status update from it, it tends to be he's got some high score or he feels 90% happy this morning which is actually quite a strange way of doing it because I tend to just phone my mate up and say, hey mate, yeah, I'm all right, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, blah, blah, blah. And I think for people, the older you get, I tend to use kind of, you know, I say I or older teenagers would, I assume, would use it as more of the kind of live calendar that we do. So it's a kind of place to exchange social currency. So, you know, I've seen this video or I had this night out or I did whatever, and you can kind of interact with people that way. And it's, you know, it's just convenient. Um, I think the reason for brands like Nokia or whoever else to, you know, really use social media as a channel is because you can engage with people in an environment that they're really comfortable with. So, you know, the natural tendency in the past would be, yeah, let's create some adverts, let's create some posters, let's put them out, put them on TV. But actually, how many people really are comfortable in those environments now? Because it's a million miles away from them, obviously it's on the TV. But if you're talking to your friends in Facebook, then actually having a subject, say the new Nokia Lumia 800 or whatever it might be, 
is actually a really nice way to capture them in an environment they're, in, you know, they're, they're comfortable and familiar with. So I think when you look at the activities that people do, I think it is based on that whole thing of people having shorter attention spans now. So you know, in the past, you would think, yeah, you can put a TV ad or you can do whatever. But the fact that people do have these short attention spans, and I think the fact that Barbie was saying that people are going to, you know, teens are going onto Twitter increasingly over Facebook because it's short, snappy. You know, you can take something, you can digest it. If you like it, you can pass it on. You can, you know, rewire it in every, whichever way you want to, and basically pass it on. And I think it kind of comes down to that point of, I think about myself when I was a teenager, and I'm sure it doesn't change. You know, is it cool? I think, I think, like you say, you don't necessarily digest things on all the levels that you do when you're not a teenager. So you kind of think, well, does this affect my job or does this affect my whatever? Do I pay the rent? Where, you know, if something's quite cool, then you can probably find the means to do it, pass it on, share it, whatever. So, from our point. You, I think you know when we go to create campaigns or whatever you know I think we've really got to think how do we if we're trying to talk to teens you know how do we make this cool and I think a lot of those elements is find the right partners so you know you go out and you say well which artist is really credible at the moment so you know a good example is the Lumia Live event we recently did where leading this project obviously I kind of grew up in a Chemical Brothers Basement Jacks generation and, you know your, your initial reaction is let's go out and let's get the Chemical Brothers to do something or whatever but obviously you go and you start looking into it and you kind of think, well, if I'm trying to talk to a bunch of 18-year-olds, the chemical brothers aren't actually that cool for this generation. We need to go to dead mail. So I think it's that, that really a point of having social media out there. You can actually really dig in and in kind of real time find out very quickly what is relevant to the people that you're trying to talk to. Um, and I think some of the trends on that line of being a teenager is that you, I guess there's a lot of, you know, the older you get, you tend to have more money. Admittedly, you've got more avenues that drain it away. But when you're a teenager, you don't necessarily have a lot of money. So, you know, a lot of things that we do tend to be, you know, giving things away because if you can give away free phones or free experiences, actually, it's a nice way to, you know, really capture something that's that's really relevant to these people. And we tend to see the engagement levels are really high on that. So, you know, if I think about some campaigns that we've done that have, you know, have, have worked for us, we did a we did a tie-up with um, One Direction, and we did a free phone, or well, a free phone you could buy it, but it was a cheap phone. And uh, we did a Facebook game where you had to guess where the phone was hidden. So they all went up to the screen at the front, they all had it, and then they passed it around, and basically had to guess at the end which one had the phone, and you could win one. And we had. The engagement levels were, you know, were ridiculous. Facebook used that as a as an example now. So that was a really good one where you took, I guess, a someone that was popular to that target. You combined it with the social media and Facebook, and obviously had that element of giving away something that people could really buy into. Um, I guess aiming to a slightly older one, we did some seeding with the X Factor. So the new phone, we gave a load of all the Express to contestants that phone a couple of weeks before it came out, and we did this viral of them basically all the contestants opening up the phone and going crazy and saying, oh my God, I can't believe how amazing it is, blah, blah, blah. And actually that got really good hits and got a lot of people talking about what is the X Factor phone. And obviously when we revealed it, that was really good. Um, another example where it was a really good campaign, but I didn't feel it necessarily worked amazingly well was we did this um, a link up with Chipmunk, the, the kind of UK grime rapper or rhyme rapper, depending on how you want to say it. Um, and Terry Deary, who's a, an author who had the horrible histories. and. Um, we basically got Terry Deary to write a novel on the, on the handset. Then we produced some video content of Chipmunk talking about it, so basically reading the story out. And it was actually amazing content, but it actually seemed to appeal really well to a kind of an old demographic. So, you know, Chipmunk tweeted about it, Chipmunk put it on his Facebook. And we got people like the BBC and Radio 4 and all these people talking about it. But actually, for some reason, it felt like the parts were all there in place, but it didn't necessarily resonate with the youth. So it's a really good example of how you think you can do it right, but actually, for some reason, if it's not quite cool, then it isn't necessarily going to brush. So, you know, that was another one. Um, I think the big one for me to talk about as a really good case study is the Lumia Live video. So I don't know how many of you have seen it. I'll, I'll play the video to you. I'll put your hand up and say I've had enough of it. But to cut a long story short, we Nokia made a big strategic decision to abandon our role platform join forces with Microsoft and kind of basically launch a whole new category. So I think they mentioned before, BlackBerry were doing very well with the youth. A big thing called BlackBerry Messenger was taking a lot of the, uh, the youth headlines. Um, other platforms are doing really well. So from our point of view, we we're kind of relaunching Nokia to a whole new set of consumers. So, you know, not to say we've missed out because we still sell a lot of phones to that gen you know, those teenage generations, but we weren't necessarily always seen as a really cool brand. It was more Nokia as the kind of reliable, good value, whatever kind of brand. So we had to come in and do something that was, you know, big, talkable, shareable, all those things, you know, give us the opportunity to win prizes, etc. And we came up with Lily Belive. So 
Lumia means light, so we thought, how can we do something with light? We've got projections. How can we make it different? We teamed it up with Dead Mouse, who was an artist that had three million Facebook fans, social reach that was you know, beyond the scale of most of the artists we could find out there. And then obviously, in terms of the amount of channels that it worked on, it gave us the opportunity to talk on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and then also branch out to lots of different blogs, websites of all different scales. And it really worked well for us. So in terms of the reach, you know, it, we got into, I think it was 80 different countries around the world. We got 3.2 million hits on our own video, which I guess if you think about, it's a five minute video, so to get you know, 3.2 million people engaged on your video for at least three minutes is actually quite a nice level of time to have them engaged with your brand. I think there, was, there were over a thousand user generated videos from people that were there that shared it on the internet as well, um, of which there's well over a million hits of those. I think it was something like 20 million Twitter impressions on the evening. So, you know, we really created something that was, I guess, truly viral, you know. We jumped 20,000 Facebook fans on the evening. There was 140,000 people there viewing it at once on the internet. Um, so, you know, we, we generally did do something that was truly viral, and I think that was a really good example. When we looked at the numbers, the majority were that kind of really sweet spot of kind of mid to late teens and then obviously going up through the early 20s. So I think from our point of view, it was a really good case study of how to bring all the right elements together to really resonate with the audience. So I'll show you a little bit of it because, you know, it's just me kind of blowing smoke up my own. So um, you just put your hand up when you've had enough and then I'll finish and we can move on and I'll save it for more questions. Working. Forty thousand people there on the, on the day that sharing it, and actually it was quite funny. My friend, who was um, my age, said he, he he left because he nearly got into a fight with a bunch of chavs that were the age of like sixteen to eighteen. He was with his girlfriend, so it kind of really showed that if you can bring the right elements together, you can really get you know really get that viral traction. And I think you know shareability and that kind of cool factor is the thing that will really cut through ultimately. But yeah, you probably get the impression. If you want to see it, that's the name of the video. No worries. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> um, and uh, last but not least, um, Chris, I think you're um, it's on the desktop, the, the video you want to show. Are you a PC? Are you on Mac? Yeah, I'm on Mac. <laughs> Hello, hello. Sorry, I'm, uh, I was late. I was at uh, Netta Porto, so uh, they were fashionably late for the meeting that I had and then uh, ran across town. My, um, so I'm older than most people, so my main concern with teenagers at the moment is it's my 16-year-old girl's birthday, 16-year-old birthday party on Friday night. So uh, the two concerns are she wants me to do the music, so will I still be credible and talkable to on Saturday morning? And the other thing is the amount of alcohol, just enough so they're cool and slightly drunk and not too much where we have obviously the phone call from neighbours or other parents or even the police. So I think that's going to be the toughest balance. Um, and there should actually be talking about teenagers. It's a fucking nightmare being a parent actually. I've got four kids and uh, they don't say hello when you walk in and they don't say goodnight when they go to bed. But they obviously want a Blackberry that costs £10.23 a month and my daughter managed to get through 30 quid on her 
on her phone, even though she's got the crappiest phone around, she still managed to spend 30 quid a month on it. So it's all that sort of stuff. Uh, but So I have observations of four kids and having done a few things. Um, and I've actually got loads of slides here, so I'm just going to rush through what I think are the relevant ones um, of what I've learned from doing uh, Red Nose Day, of which we, I did Red Nose Day 09, I was creative director, we had a team of 50 people, did the TV show and the noses, sold 10 million noses, Sainsbury's made more profit because they were selling 10 million, million noses to young people. And, um, and obviously it was all about content as well. And then I did the Legacy of the World Cup, which was... Um, all governments said they would get every child in the world into school by 2015. Obviously, they're way behind that. Um, and so we used the World Cup as a, a leverage to get lots of footballers supporting it while lots of world leaders were together in South Africa. And we actually raised uh, 400 million pounds out of it, which was OK. Uh, I'll tell you at the end of this why I've created Blue Dot and why actually 400 million pounds is nothing. So um, I've just put some things here, new millennials up here. Uh, this was a, um, a thing for people running causes, so it would be, it would say about causes in it, but generally it's relevant to anybody. Um, they do, you know, it's have my idea or no idea syndrome, don't care for more than a moment. They don't care about much stuff, and they especially don't care for more than a moment. It's in that moment that you have to get them to do something, which is like creating massive Nokia things, is that moment. Um, they want to take the credit, want instant gratification. Um, engaging millions existing in 2012, the existing model is not working. So my thing is don't create a new brand, don't create a new campaign, don't create charity or cause, new software or website. It's, it's out there already or there's too many of it and you should build on top of whatever's out there. All the tools are out there, it's putting them together. It's not necessarily creating a new one. I know everyone's talking about pin interest this week, but you know how many new websites do we talk about? How many are successful, and especially with the teenage market? Hardly any, really. Literally 0 point something percent. So my aim is to use those tools and, um, and create your success out of those tools rather than actually creating your own separate thing. Um, in fact, my, my biggest thing, if you ever wanted to create a successful campaign with teenagers, is just do a deal with Facebook. You know, we spent, it's one of these slides in here, we spent six weeks trying to get fans on Red Nose Day, leading up to Red Nose Day. We got 25,000 fans in six weeks from zero to 25,000 fans. I thought, we're not going to reach that tipping point. So we went to see Facebook, we did a deal uh, where they could sell digital red noses and they would put advertising behind it. And in the next four days, we got 200,000 fans, and, or 200,000 more, we had 225,000 in six weeks and four days. So that's the deal that you need to do. They've obviously got that power. Um, so as I said, identify a moment, create a goal for that moment, provide the platform to score that goal, have the final result. I'll go into what that, that means. And, and the sort of the Nokia thing was, you know, what is a moment when you can grab the attention of people? And it might be your own moment, or it might be grabbing the moment like we did with the World Cup. The World Cup's there, the eyes of the world are on the World Cup, so we're going to use that moment to get people to do what we want them to do. Um, and create one goal. There's far too many people doing too many things when they've got that moment. Oh, we're going to sell them this, we're going to get them to sign up to that, we're going to get them to sign up to this, that, and everything. But it's just choose one thing. This was obviously cause-related stuff, but choose one thing and just get them to do one thing. Um, provide the platform to, to score this winner in the build-up. Decide how long your build-up is going to be. One of my big things is that um, when you start a campaign, you've got to do something every single day of that campaign because it just drops out of the, the news. And if you've, once you've dropped out of the news or out of the engagement, you don't get it back. It, it never comes back. There was a... Um, there was a thing with the, uh, the bloggers in Iran when they, and there was lots of the use of the color green and lots of blogging and everyone was talking about it, the media were talking about it and then it disappeared overnight and, the, and they didn't disappear overnight. The reason the media disappeared overnight on it was that Michael Jackson died and no one went back to that story. So you've got, whenever you create a campaign, it's got to withstand other news stories going on. So I'm very big, whenever we do anything, we create a beginning of the campaign and the moment at the end and we hit it hard every single day. Um, I miss that one, new rules. So uh, it's an obvious one, been used for a while. Real time is the new prime time. You know, if it's not now, then it's, it's, it's irrelevant, essentially. Um, give up control and still win. There's lots of people that still, obviously, you know, I, we did Red Nose Day and I went in and said, we're not doing any moderation. This was, uh, and especially on Red Nose Day night itself, you can't moderate the number of comments and, and sharing that's going on, but there's no point. If you've, you've got to concentrate on providing a good product and letting your audience support you and moderate it because they will support and say, no, it's good, this is brilliant, or whatever, but there's no point taking out people slagging you off because it's just hiding the problem rather than solving it. 
Um, people don't really care about your product or great ideas. This was, actually, this was the slide for engagement for Red Nose Day. You know, we hammered home. It's like the long tail in reverse. But that long tail is important. You know, you need to hammer home because you're, you're getting, you're building up to that moment when people go, oh, they've, they've seen it around and now, bang, we're going to get an action out of people. So you need to tell them a million times. It is that thing. It's, uh, you know, people in this room, you, you say, I've never heard of that. And someone tells you, tells you about something, you say, I've never heard about it. And then you hear about it six times in the next three days. And you go, wow, that's amazing. And obviously, it was in the same eyesight of you for six times in the last three days. You just didn't see it. And once you see it and it comes from a, a credible source, then you see it everywhere. But you've got to hammer away. What, don't worry about, you know, boring people. Just hammer away your message. There's millions of them out there. Um, only do what you do best. Uh, my thing is being open source and outsourcing. You know, don't, don't try and do stuff that you're not the very best at. Work with partners who can, who can do the very best. You, you're not going to succeed if you're not at the very best at every single part of what you're offering. Um, I still, the, the real world is still the big driver, still even with young people. T you know, TV, we talk about internet and everything, but it's still really TV, the um, big driver. Another complaint to my kids, they, you know, I try and discuss with them things, but now I'm barred from having any discussion about the in-betweeners. They own in-betweeners. We're not allowed to watch it as parents, boring and old. Um, but TV, at, on obviously on-demand viewing, is uh, the real driver. I work in coffee shops. I think that's where everyone should work. It's where your audience is. Whatever you're doing, you're always selling to other people in some capacity, and they sit in coffee shops having a good time, having a good chat. If you want to know what your audience is doing, that's where they are. Go and join them in Starbucks at, at, as teenagers. Um, run a ca great campaign before anyone knows if your product is any good. You can, uh, I put a picture of Robbie Williams there for some reason a while ago, but uh, you can create a lot of, you know, it's, it's called hype, but it works. You know, if you can get a lot of interest, your product, ultimately, your product's got to live up to it, to it, but you can create a separate campaign, almost separate from your product, building that, that up to that moment. Um, and if your product is no good, change jobs or change sides because uh, you, you're not going to succeed if your product is no good. You know, I've, the only things I've worked on that have been successful are because they're good products, not because I've made a bad product sell more than it should do. Um, get yourself a great opponent. That works uh, really well in this audience, of, uh, in the, this market, teenagers. Um, they need something that they're working against. Um, and obviously, you know, we had Christmas number ones that were, were anti-X Factor because Simon Cowell was the enemy, and, and so everyone wanted to work against the enemy. It's a great word. Poverty is obviously what's used in the cause world. Uh, be relevant, as I've put on here. Literally twice as many people retweeted a tweet because it was relevant to people's lives than it wasn't relevant to people's lives, and it was a fact. Facts people find boring, but make it as relevant as possible. Um, provide the nudge for participation. Your customers need a nudge to engage. They're selfish. What's in it for them? That's actually led to what I've uh, created now in, in Blue Dot. But, you know, kids are rewarded at school. There's, a, there's four companies making a lot of money by providing reward points into school. And they're not reward points for achieving something. They're reward points just for turning up on time or, do it, or handing their homework in. So you've got that. Um, uh, consumer world we're in now, and then you move, and, they, and outside obviously there's nectar points and every other points going on, and then the big, the big one that everyone talks about is obviously gamification and the rewarding of, of achieving levels in gamification. So young people, there is a massive thing of what's in it for me, what, what's going to tip me over to be interested in this. Um, manufacture success, that book's been around for a while, obviously if you start to get people in, then make sure they're telling someone else about it and they're telling more than one person about it. Once you create that loop, you can't fail. Um, get someone better than you to do your job. This was two people I worked with, Queen Rania of Jordan and obviously Richard Curtis. And, um, and it's part of that thing of being in the inner circle. Once you're in the inner circle, things happen. And if you're not, they don't. There's a, there's a massive difference. And so, you know, that's where you dead mouse gets you in that inner circle. You know, you get, you need something to bring you in there, which brings me, whether it's the next point or not, probably not, is that celebrity is still that thing. It buys you in very quickly. Uh, tweet, just um, followers of new tech and comms are the best sheep to follow you. I used to run a youth marketing agency and, uh, and people say, oh, the youth market's really hard to get hold of. The opinion form is really hard to get hold of. But actually, they're the easiest because they're desperate to find new stuff. It's actually the gap behind those people that is the problem, the people that aren't desperate to find your stuff. Enable journalists to show off. I, um, 
worked on Friends United, made that sort of successful. And the, and the big thing we did there was enable journalists to show off about it. They weren't just reporting on something. They were showing off that they were a journalist where their old school friends were working in a local bank or co-op or something, and, and they'd made it all the way to London working for the Times. And so they all wanted to write about that. Um, but it is, you know, it's enabling a journalist to say, you know, be the best, or the, obviously and often it's the first user of something um, or the best user of something, but you've got to enable them. They've got to be part of the story. And that's uh, what I was saying earlier, you know, go something live every single day. One goal was a campaign that was 77 days long, Red Nose Day was 42 days long. You've got to create something every single day. Um, and go to the public, they won't be bothered to come to you. You know, when I started at Comet Relief, uh, people were concerned that not enough people come from the BBC website to our website, but they won't. Wherever people first come across your brand, that's it. You've just got to make sure that the experience they have at that point is what you want them to have, whether that's in 140 characters or whether it's in a 50-page website. But they're not going to go much further than that first experience. Um, work with people already doing what you want to do. So they're the people that have already got an audience in, in the audience that you want. And again, it's similarly, you know, it's, got, it's giving your experience where they are rather than again getting them to click through. Queen Rania was a co chair of, of One Goal, but we wanted people to support One Goal on her site, not say, oh, click through. The, obviously, the drop off rate is enormous. Um, rip someone off and get someone to rip you off. That's uh, proves you're in the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist, and as we were saying, real time is, is prime time. is is everything really at the moment. So that was us ripping off a Cadbury's advert that was at the time. Love celebrities, everyone else does, still true. That was a little thing where you know, we had Comic Relief's logo on that page for weeks, and then we put Chris Moore's page uh, photo up, and obviously that's the little icon that appeared on everyone else's wall, and, and traffic doubled, literally for that one reason alone. Why is Chris Moore's picture on my friend's wall? Um, share, obviously, obviously, obviously share, but a lot of people still control the sharing of some of their assets. Don't control the sharing of any of your assets. If it's good enough for you to put online, then it's good enough for anyone to share online. But still a lot of people protect certain assets for some reason. Uh, be flexible, must be able to amend your approach or direction quickly if demand calls it. I've, I've had to stop working, you know, agencies are meant to be the cool thing. I've had to stop working with agencies because they're too slow and can't change direction. You've got to, you know, there's someone who's making millions out writing a book about common sense called The Lean Startup. And, and, but that's what the web enables you to do. It enables you to be so lean and move direction as soon as you need to. Because there's no way you can stand here and you're achieving something in three months' time and know what that's going to look like in three months' time and be successful. If you did, you'd, you'd be a billionaire and you'd be talking to a bigger audience than this. Uh, be real. Obviously, that's what people love at the moment as well. Be, you know, and hopefully have always loved, but the, the web gives the output for real stories. Throw enough mud. It's, you know, it's, it was with advertising. 50% of my advertising works. I don't know which 50%. That was a famous old quote from the ad industry. With, with social media, no one knows which part of a million parts work. So you do have to keep trying. Just try it professionally and as cheaply as possible. But try it. You know, we had three different Red Nose Day apps, and, and one of them ended up top 10. But there's no way of really knowing. You know, everyone talks about Angry Birds, massive success. They've got credibility for massive success, but I think it was their 51st game. They had 50 failures first, and then Angry Birds was their 51st. They didn't plan to have a 51st be successful. Uh, I'll skip through that one. Use child labor. They, know, they don't know any different. You do, and they are good at PowerPoint. Um, look at that. And, uh, and now I've created, um, so, so the thing about uh, Red Nose, they raised 82 million quid. The campaign for education from governments raised 400 million. And then I come home, I live near Westfield um, in West London, and there was a cutting in the standard that said shoppers revive Westfield by spending 870 million pounds in one year. In the same year, I just got half that amount off every government in the world. So that's two and a half million pounds every day. It's where I've just been now and where uh, Netta Porter are based. And, um, and it's packed all the time. And that, I wanted to come up with an idea that engaged normal people in doing good. Um, because that's, there's far more money in that shopping centre than there is in the pockets of every government in the world at the moment. Um, so that was that story. Use, it was about using, again, using great content with comic relief, great content with one goal, and, so, and whistle story. So we created Blue Dot, which is a, a, it's a social currency um, at the moment. The nearest thing to be able to tell is it's like nectar for good. So if you volunteer for a charity, any of 9,000 charities in Britain, or donate to any charity, payroll giving, 
uh, signing petitions, you can get blue dots. And with those blue dots, you can exchange them for downloads and discounts and offers and tickets and all sorts of things. And, and again, we've, it, it, it's enabled us to, to work with Coldplay and One Direction and JLS and Ed Sheeran and, and um, Rizzle Kicks and all the new artists, because you go to them and you say, if you record something now or give us something now, then the only people that can get it are people that have helped any of 9,000 charities and their own choice of charity, rather than it just be about Crumb Relief or Save the Children or Oxfam or just about the big people. You, they can, businesses can use this and charities can use this and go and say, you support who you want to support and you can still get reward, rewarded in engaging with famous people. And so it gives you rewards that you can buy, but it also goes on a, a CV, a, we call it a good account, and it's a record of all the blue dots you've earned. And, um, and the government sort of love it. They've announced they've given us a big grant today um, because that, that CV is a sort of a record of the good that you've achieved um, and can obviously help you into, into work or, or with uh, a promotion. And, uh, and then there's some of the people that have been talking about that and some of the people giving out blue dots. We're working with Heart FM this week and um, all sorts of big issue about to give out blue dots. And there's some of the people that have given us some products. Ed Sheeran there, you're talking about, you know, the like Chemical Brothers not uh, engaging with this audience anymore. I, I do, Ed Sheeran and the way that he's been marketed, it completely sums up um, the difference in marketing now between what it was five, ten years ago and, and today. And like yesterday, Ed Sheeran had a free four track download. You know, here, here's a link on Twitter to free four tracks. There's no way that any artist would have given away free music a few years ago. And, he, he, and he's one of the biggest selling artists. So, you know, it's giving away free music is helping him to sell more music. There you go. That's me done. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'll throw it open to the floor. Any burning questions or any questions at all? Just wait one second. We'll just get the mic down the front there. Not, not really a question, more of a, a, a query. Uh, Chris, is your pres uh, Chris and Barbie, will those presentations be available online afterwards? Can we get a, a mic down the, down the front here? Yes, yeah, great. Can you take these mics as well? Ah. If you want to. Hi. Um, it's probably for Barbie, actually. What is the main difference between teenagers and adults um, online? What's, can you see sort of patterns, how differently they watch things or how differently they sort of interact? Is there any sort of patterns that you found which are like, hey, those are two big differences? Um, the attention span isn't probably as great, um, and I think very much you, you, you mentioned that as well. That you, you talked about um, the kind of the way that they're now used to flipping from one thing to another. I think teenagers have always done that to some extent. So I think um, to actually grab their attention, it's actually got to be something that absolutely speaks to them and stands out, and that their friends have talked about. And obviously, that's a kind of circle that you have to square. Um, but so yeah, I think it, they they do. I mean, I'll give you an example, uh, which is not exactly this. But um, when I talk to teenagers and I'm talking to them about, you know, um, a class of teenagers about something I did last week on tablets, um, I lost them after five minutes. Where as students, you kind of lose them after ten minutes. So I think that's the difference in that it. it their, their attention span probably isn't as great. And there's been a lot of concern about this and, you know, what's going to happen and, and lots of, again, you, you, you mentioned this. Um, and it probably is okay because, in fact, um, after the time they're actually engaging with um, online digital, um, their brains actually do go back to normal. <laughs> so it's a kind of, a, it's, a, it's just a different pattern, I think. Um, and I also liked, just want to point out that um, you talked about, about television and actually we, we, we're always talking about digital and in fact television is big. And it really is. When you, when you talk to teenagers and you monitor what they're doing, we've just done something where we've monitored all the media that um, 15 teenagers um, looked at over the last, over a period of a week. It really was television more than anything, even though they had lots of devices around them. It was actually television. So we mustn't forget that either. Any other questions? The gentleman at the back there. While that mic's going over there, Barbie, do you want to just give a bit of a understanding of what the difference between boys and girls are in the teenage space? 
Um, yes, I think that's quite, it is quite significant. I mean, basically, everything that teenagers are doing online is everything that teenagers have always done. It's just doing it in a different space. So that whole sense of looking for an identity, um, working out who they are, thinking about their friends, communicating with their friends, um, they're just doing it in a completely different sphere. Nothing different is going on. The difference between boys and girls is inc incredibly stereotyped, actually. Um, boys will go on and play games and they'll not communicate as much and girls will spend hours and hours communicating um, on an ongoing basis about nothing very much probably but it's a very kind of almost a reassurance and they're doing that through all those media that I mentioned you know so they're blackberrying um, they might be FaceTiming now um, and it goes on and on so there is there is definitely a difference there's less communication that goes on between boys and boys um, than there, there is between girls and also girls really love shopping apps I mean it's so stereotypical it's mm -hmm. not true um, Mark, as a follow-on to that point, and I'll just get to your question in one moment. Um, what are you seeing? Are, are teens more responsive to, 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 to marketing messages or less responsive than adults um, to marketing messages? And, and I'll kind of follow up with um, asking Chris the same thing on that kind of giving um, a side of things. Um, in terms of responsiveness, I guess, I think there may be a little bit... I'm just trying to think I can word this exactly. I wouldn't say any, they're less or more responsive, but I think the difference is I think the, you, you tend to feel you have more power as an adult to go and purchase something, so you've got those stages of kind of see something, consider it, buy it. I guess you've got an extra, if you're a young teenager, you've got that kind of uh, gate in the middle of parents that maybe stop you on a lot of things, but I guess at the same time, you've got the bank of mum and dad that probably is always giving to a lot of kids these, these days all the time. So I guess I think the, the ability to purchase depends. So if if it's something that's quite throwaway and cheap, then I guess everyone's the same. If it's something more expensive, then you've got, obviously, to convince somebody else as well. So uh, as a brand, you've got to be able to convince, obviously, the teenager and the, the parents that it's worthwhile, you know, worthwhile the investment. Mm. So does that affect your marketing message, the fact that teenagers have the gatekeeper of sometimes mum and dad? I think to a degree, yes, but I think from our, obviously when you're dealing in mobile phones, there's a slight difference in that obviously it's, it's quite an expensive purchase compared to most things. Obviously, if it's a sweets or it's chocolates or it's something that's very small, then obviously you're more free to do that kind of thing. If it's purchasing a mobile phone and committing to £10 a month paying for it, then obviously it probably will be if you're a younger teenager. You'll have to you know, really aim to the parents. Obviously, if it's a little bit older and it's a, a later teenager, then I guess something like the Dead Mouse is a good example of just going direct with something that they can believe and buy into. Chris, are you seeing differences with teenagers being more responsive to charity and donations and that side of things? Um, yes. That, well, the, the cliche is that, that kids care more about the world than, than we did. and, and and that is true. They are they are more aware. It's weird when we were when I was younger. There was less swamping of consumerism, but less knowledge of charity. And now there's swamping of consumerism, an umbrella of consumerism we live in, but more of an understanding of charity. But it's it's you put the word charity on any messaging, 90% of people will turn off straight away. It's just even if you've got Ed Sheeran's name on it it's, as well. It's it's still hard to get that message through. Really hard. You know, say the children have launched something this morning and um, a big campaign where you can choose a date. Uh, so you go on and choose your date, most people will choose their birthday, and um, to say when, and they're gonna get back to you on that date for you to write a letter to David Cameron saying you should have a, a uh, conference about poverty for kids. And so there was huge publicity, it was on breakfast TV, et cetera, et cetera, and so I had a look on the website, 142 people had signed up, and they had celebrities across all breakfast TV this morning. And um, so that just shows you, it's hard. But are you finding that teenagers respond better than adults? Yeah, the, the absolute core people that respond are mums with two kids in their mid-30s. That is the absolute target, traditional target market for charities in Britain and with Comet Relief and Children in Need, etc. But ch char um, kids, ki kids having in, uh, or, uh, and being educated or a slight inbuilt or just picking up from the ether that they care more about the world, but I, I think you know, we're doing okay, but, but no one's yet building a model that engages them in how they do something about that. Because volunteering is, considered, is generally considered a nightmare. You know, most, most kids go shopping because there's actually nothing else to do. And say so we used to play football and 
that, but no one goes out and plays football anymore. They just go to a shopping center and, and hang out with their mates. And it's because there's nothing else to do and volunteering sector is trying to somehow come to terms with that and say, here's, a, here's an opportunity for six of you to go off and do something this afternoon, have some fun together and get rewarded for it. And so it's as much, you know, yeah, they're, they're aware, but the sector hasn't caught up in, make, in enabling them to do something. Mm. Mm. Um, I, we found that um, teenagers are incredibly altruistic in a way that they really weren't um, even 10 years ago. And although they can't perhaps do things like um, give money because they probably haven't got any money to give, um, they are certainly very keen to help each other. And I think that whole area of um, peer support has been something that's actually grown enormously in the last few years. So if you kind of turn around and not think about actually giving but supporting each other, it's absolutely massive. And what we're finding on a lot of, we've got doing quite a lot of work around um, helplines and websites that um, are giving advice and help to young people. Uh, and what they want really is to hear from other people who are helping each other. So, uh, and that's also being reflected in schools where the, there's a lot of kind of su peer support mentoring systems going on, um, peer support counseling. And I think that's something that's really quite new. So it's a kind of slightly different angle, but it's definitely something that's, that's growing with young people now. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I picked up on Barbie's comment that um, FB use is, is falling off or, or replaced by Twitter use in, in younger uh, age groups and, and raised two questions uh, I had. Firstly, kind of as, as teenagers grow older, do you think they will grow into more adult ways of communication, i.e. less social, less, less interactive, more, more passive? And, and secondly, that to what extent is communication in, in these groups kind of influenced by the platform they're using, or is, is the platform secondary to how the teenagers want to interact with their, with their social group? Um, it's a really, really good question, that. And I think that certainly, if I answer the, the second first, um, I think the platform um, is immensely important. And I think I just mentioned earlier, very briefly, about the um, increasing use of um, tablets with kids. So obviously iPads, but also other tablets as well. Um, and we've done some fascinating work um, in schools. There are some schools in the UK that have given all children in secondary schools um, a tablet to use. And this is actually, the purpose of this is very much for teaching, obviously. But we've, no, we've found so far, and this is quite new, it's only been happening really in the last six months or so, that there's a noticeable difference in the way that they communicate it with each other at school and outside school because of the use of tablets, because it's totally, totally on, on hand. So in a similar way to, to phones and smartphones, um, but somehow because these are kind of allowed in school, that's actually definitely affecting um, the, the way in which they're communicating. In terms of developmental stage and younger and older teenagers, um, I think that there isn't such a sense of perhaps keeping things private. There's less naivety as teenagers get older. Um, but there's also much more knowledge now than there was five years ago. So five years ago when we were doing our research, pe uh, young um, people were putting everything up online. They didn't really understand about privacy settings. Um, and it probably made them pretty vulnerable. Now they are absolutely aware of privacy settings. Um, all the messages from school are about security, security, security. And they are probably, therefore, almost turning against Facebook because they're a little bit concerned um, about kind of who's going to be seeing it. And also that notion of history. We were very worried a few years ago about, you know, do these kids realize that this is going to be there forever? And they actually get that now, which they didn't. So I think, it's, I think they're becoming more sophisticated users at a younger and younger age. So that's why I suspect the younger teenagers um, are favoring, beginning to favor, very much, it's very early, but beginning to favor Twitter as opposed to Facebook, where it's kind of like everything is up there. I thought it was just Justin Bieber. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Mark, following on from that, are you finding um, a change in the use of platforms or, or, or some platforms, you know, we constantly hear about, you know, no one's going to be using Facebook anymore, you know, uh, 
obviously that's that's not the case. But what are you seeing with are you seeing trends away from certain platforms or towards other platforms? I think the big thing for my side is it's all about the power of the idea still. So the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter what platform, you could have every platform in the world lined up. If you've not got a great idea to help drive them, then it's pointless, you know. So from from my point of view, I think you see the stats and it, it does look like there's a kind of a general decline in the engagement on Facebook, so people are spending a little bit less time on there. But if you look at YouTube, YouTube's really growing. And I think that, that the fact shows that if people are putting great content on there, people will go to it. So I guess from, from my point of view, yes, we, we have growth on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. But actually, I think it, that's the testament to the content that we're creating, not necessarily just because, you know, it's just, just do it for the sake of doing it, you know. Well, uh, and Chris, kind of as a, as a follow-on from that, are you finding that some of your platforms because obviously you reward people for engaging on the different platforms. Are you finding that, that the users are asking for you to include activity on, on other platforms other than just Facebook? Or? Yeah, still, um, you know, I don't know how much it is in the consumer world these days, but um, in the cause world it's considered that um, people want you on an email database far more than a Facebook database or fan base of, of obviously fans of a page. So, you know, with our third parties, people want to get people to their website and sign them up to an email database, whereas I'm not so fast, so we're pretty, we're open to everything. Um, one thing I was going to say about teenagers now is that, is, is def as we're saying, very short attention span, but actually, you know, you, you grow up in life, they tell you the thing that makes you happy is to live in the present, and um, rather than worry about the future or worry about the past, just live in that moment, and, and I think that's what teenagers are tending to do, and whether we might not struggle to engage with them, they're actually just living in that exact moment the whole time, um, which could actually mean they're far happier than any other generation. But also, I think they have no qualms at all, as far as I've seen, of just deleting entire masses of content, of their own content, because it was in the past and it's irrelevant now, or they're worried, or you know, the Facebook timeline went live and there was a huge amount of deletion that went on, which must have concerned Facebook, although supposedly it's around somewhere, can come back again. But um, I can see, there's also a thing with, you know, I, I'm amazed that a, a you know, branch out or another Facebook um, sort of employment LinkedIn version hasn't really taken off because I can't see young people using LinkedIn because it's so dull and boring and two-dimensional that surely, you know, that A, their employer and them themselves will both be on Facebook. So they'll both be checking out each other on Facebook anyway. So why on earth would they ever end up at LinkedIn? So um, I'm interested in what happens to that whole job market and, and everything there. Mm -hmm. Barbie, from your research, are you seeing people talk about, you know, we've, someone mentioned Pinterest and, and Google Plus and, you know, Instagram, and there are quite a few platforms that are kind of bubbling up. Are any in your research and talking to young kids, are any that are kind of a, a being mentioned more now than they were, let's say, six months ago? Yeah, um, Google Plus is something that has just begun to creep in and they, they've really kind of got that and they, they just love that because of the, um, uh, because of, uh, I suppose, because of the range of options that they're able to choose. And it's almost, it's kind of, it's gone a full circle because when they started off um, using social, pla social networking platforms, they were very much um, not so much into creativity, but having the creativity come to them. And it's almost like they've gone back again, where they don't have to do all the hard work, it's actually done for them. And I think that that's a pattern that seems to be happening, happening as well. Mark, from your standpoint, have you trialled any platforms that you not regret trying, but that you've got some good learnings and those learnings are maybe not do it for a while? Um, I think from my point of view, there's, I think the big trends were in Facebook where we, everyone went through a stage of building tabs. It was kind of like, we need a landing page. So we all know years ago, it was let's build a mini site for our campaign and then actually no one really goes there and it kind of lives for two or three months and it dies. And I think my opinion is that tabs have kind of become the same thing where people need to build a tab for some reason. They invest a lot of money making sure it, you know, it can stream videos, it can take conversations, all this, you know, all these things that you're creating in this one hub. And actually, they're a bit, I'm not saying they're pointless, but I think it's a lot of money spent in areas where I would personally invest it in others. And I think a lot of people to kind of are waking up to that. Mm -hmm. So there's a question down the front here. Hi, uh, this question risks being a little bit controversial, but that probably says more about where I'm coming from and where most people are coming from. But I'm doing, I'm doing some research currently on the psychology of social networking, and what I've noticed in surveying the literature is very similar to what I notice here, which is about 
15% is about understanding teenagers and 85% is about how we can use teenagers to sell for, to them or get them to do something for us. And I'm kind of curious about what your perspectives are. First, I think, Barbie, on, on your side about, you're talking about developing young people's sophistication with the social networking and whether they have a sense of when they're being sold to and how they're being used, in a sense. And I'm not saying that, that just the commercial use or, of course, sort of the charitable use is necessarily a bad thing, but there's so much information out there that we can now use to understand where people are coming from, and so much, so much of it seems to be used the other way around. So I'm just curious if you guys might want to comment on that as well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know more than us. All I would say is, uh, with, um, is that they, they're, you know, unfortunately still gullible and young, and, and, and in fact it shows itself far more than, than in a, in, invariably lots of young boys get caught up in a text thing where their entire month's money will disappear in two seconds because they agreed to something, some bit of spam on a text message spam. So if they're agreeing to that, then they're obviously not spotting cool marketing of phones necessarily. You know, I, you know they're still young kids, so, you know, I don't, the, the cliche would be they're more savvy, but it's still, you know, as a parent of four, it's still depressing to see them get caught up into something that's so deliberately spam of, of all ages and both sexes. So sorry, specifically, your, your question is, are we focused too much on yeah, I, I mean, I'm teenagers just thinking, and understanding I'm, them? I'm thinking about you know, the, the, the coming IPO of, um, of Facebook and how valuable it is because it's a resource of, of marketing. But it's also this vast resource of how we can understand how tons of people are operating, too. So I, I guess that it, it's just a comment that I wanted people to respond to, I think, because I think it hasn't been... Because the assumption is, I think, from the marketing side, when you come to events like Social Media Week, in a sense, and, and I just think it's this great wealth of information about young people as well. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think obviously most, I guess, social networks probably set off with, you know, with quite pure kind of drivers behind it. So I'd, they, it probably wasn't set up as some multi-million, billion-dollar marketing tool initially. Some guy thought, you know, it's probably quite cool to share this with this person, and obviously, as other channels such as TV or print media start to kind of, I guess the reach by those other channels might start to lower them. Other companies that say, or media companies will identify op those opportunities and move into them. And I think that's an inevitable thing that I guess we all, at least on the line, I think have a better ability to ignore the messages that are put in front of you compared to more traditional forms of media because there's other distractions around them as well. That's a question here. Hi, uh, yeah, I was wondering about sort of user-generated content, talked a lot about communication, but uh, I guess for Barbie, are young people, are teenagers interested uh, in, you know, joining in in that kind of way, whether it's video or creating graphics and stuff, and then for the other guys, have you done anything that's been successful with user-generated content and what works, what doesn't? The answer is yes, completely. Um, they love user-generated um, and, and actually, interestingly, it starts much younger as well. So we're coming across seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds who are putting stuff together um, and attempting to post it on YouTube. <laughs> Their parents are kind of finding out. So it, it, absolutely. And I think this is what is the most wonderful thing, really, for young people because they can be themselves and they can put together their own creativity and then actually see it and share it in a way they never, ever could before. Um, and they, they're loving it. And obviously, if there's a vehicle for them to do that, and if that's made easier for them at the moment, we've got YouTube, obviously, um, then that is a, an, absolute, an absolute winner. Mark, have you had any experience in the UGC space, or Chris? Yeah, we, I, I guess we, there's a lot of it, I guess, from our side. I think we, you find varying results, because you normally set a brief based on your needs. So you, know, you go out and say, we're going to launch X product or service. You know, we're going to challenge you to come up with a great idea. And actually, you know, you do get reasonable results. But I think the thing with social media or creating content, a lot, of t a lot of it is spontaneity or you've got a great idea based on your passion. So obviously, if you can hit those passions or that right moment, then yes, it's great. But obviously, you do have that, that kind of barrier of if you just go out and set a brief, it's not necessarily going to resonate with everyone and the results can be really varied. 
we had a, quite an interesting case study where we had this group called the Connectors, and it's kind of 100 students around the country that used to go out and kind of sell the Nokia message around their campus, do loads of fun, engaging things like put on parties. And we once set a competition for a, a, a phone called the Nokia X6, which um, kind of backfired on us, actually. We set a user-generated content um, video contest, and they had to go around and get students to create a shortened version of a film or something along those lines. And basically, the girl that won the competition actually completely word for word ripped off another video. So it was this video three years you know, earlier had got two million hits and we hadn't seen it and we had a, an independent judge and everything. So this girl won the prize, got flown out to Cannes and then the guy that made the video that she ripped off saw it and kind of went a little bit crazy. And obviously when you're dealing with teenagers in these situations, they don't necessarily have that kind of rational way to break it down and say, right, I've not done anything, you know, I've not killed anyone. I've cheated, I've got found out, and obviously you can imagine the reactions of someone who's in the teenage years in this, it's, it feels like it's the end of their life. So, you know, dealing with that in Twitter, in social media spaces, was actually really quite a fun challenge in hindsight because we learned a lot, but obviously at the time it was a shame for this girl and the guy that had, you know, had his, his video plagiarised. So, you know, you've got to be really careful when you're dealing, you know, particularly with people that don't have responsibilities and user-generated um, cases like that, that you're really tight on it. And it's, it's one of those things from a brand point of view that we paid an agency to do it for us. So you kind of, you entrust people that you work with regularly to do these kind of things for you. But obviously, if it does backfire, then ultimately it's always going to come back on the brand's head and it was myself who lost a week sorting it all out. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things. Yeah. And you've got a question down the front here, and I'll come to the teenager in a second. I have a question for, uh, for Dr. Clark. Um, I was just thinking about how, with teenagers, their use of different media is much more pronounced than the average. So we've seen a huge decline in people using search. I mean, not that huge, it's not going to die, but more people using uh, social media to discover, I guess in a pure way, uh, organic content. Is that more or less pronounced for teenagers? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is pronounced in quite um, quite a big way. And, all, and, and I know in schools and, and, and universities, you, you kind of have to be terribly careful about it because actually um, the information they're getting isn't necessarily accurate <laughs> or complete. Um, but no, they are absolutely doing that. So um, in some uh, groups we were doing last week, for instance, we had, I think they were kind of 13, 14, 15 year olds saying that we were asking them how they would find out about particular types of issues that might affect young people. And um, their first response was, well, I would, I'd just tweet it and wait for the answers to come back, which in a way is kind of probably what you would do with your friends. You'd ask your friends. But you know, they were actually quite sort of relying on this information. So I think, yes, I think you're absolutely right um, that they are doing that. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, they are getting the message that might not be you know, the most accurate um, answer. But uh, no, they, they, they're definitely, definitely doing that. Chris, <coughs> um, are you seeing more or less people come from search or from social than you had expected when you uh, started off Blue Dot? Um. This, you know, as I said before, and as we all know, everything is on Facebook. Everything can be channeled through Facebook. So whether it's YouTube or UGC or, or pretty much anything. So, so that's where we've placed ourselves firmly while we, you know, work on the, you know, on perfecting our model before we spread it out further. There's it's the lean startup mode. You know, yesterday one of my staff said, oh, I've set up a page on Pinterest. I'm not going to look, not bother because it's. 99.9% .9 is through Facebook, whether it's come through some other medium on its way there, but that's, that's the way that everybody shares. So. Mark? Are you, are you changing your strategy away from search more towards social, or is search still a key player in this? I think, yeah, I think search space? will always be a key player, but I think this whole, you know, the whole word of mouth and people really having your product in their hand, having real life experiences and sharing that is going to be a lot more valuable long term. So we did a really extensive seeding program for the new Lumia 800 where we actually set up this thing called the Amazing Collective and we've gone out and we put devices in consumer hands who we recruited through Facebook. So we put we ran some ads that were kind of, you know, 
very quite cryptic, so we didn't go out and say, do you want a free phone? <laughs> and are you going to you know, send us pictures? We obviously went out and said, you know, asked some kind of very subtle questions, recruited people that would be perfect for it, and we're getting some really nice results, you know, so finding people that are actively out there sharing, and, um, you know, we set up this little community of people that have got the phone and the, the set challenges that are based upon functionalities like, you know, taking and sharing pictures, but actually, you know, they've got a free phone, we're not asking them to do a lot, you know, maybe once a couple of weeks they're sending a picture doing something and that's worked really well. And I think the word of mouth is definitely a lot more powerful than the search. I think there's a, an interesting article that I'm not sure where it came from, but I saw it from Time on Twitter and they basically said I think it was over 30% of consumer reviews online are actually fakes and it, it's probably higher. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, you've got to take everything that you read online with a pinch of salt. But if obviously if it's one of your friends saying it, then you're a lot more likely to trust it. Question at the back. Um, I just wanted to know, um, I'm from Ravensbourne University and um, it's kind of like pro-digital and we pride ourselves on being a paperless university. Um, a lot of my lecturers have started using social media uh, to, in, in their lectures just to try and help us learn better. I'm just wondering, do, you feel, do any of you feel that uh, social media can um, help younger, younger people learn better um, in a traditional classroom environment? And if so, yes and like how? Wow, that's, that's a really, really good question. And I think absolutely. I think there is, from the research we've done, I think there is a big kind of gap between how lecturers and teachers are using social media and um, actually even the internet <laughs> to the way young people are. So I think, I mean, I think that's great that they're doing it at your university. And I know that a lot of universities, and that, as I mentioned, you know, even schools are giving kids um, tablets. And so that kind of form of learning is great. I think in terms of social media, um, there is a huge advantage because it can be instantly updated. They can interact with it. And I think it's, you know, done perhaps because it's seen to be connecting with that generation of young people who have been brought up through their teenage years using social media. Um, I suppose I'm, if, you, if, you, if you hear a note of skepticism in my voice, <laughs> it's because I'm wondering whether um, some lecturers and teachers maybe could try to be trying too hard and whether they absolutely get it. And that would be my only concern. I think if it works, it's great because that's a, it's a great medium. It's a, um, it can be constantly updated, it can be added to, other people can contribute, and it's that real kind of um, form of learning that isn't just you are being lectured to, it's, a, it's an interactive process, which is fantastic. And I think as a student, that is amazing, and you really feel you're learning a lot, and that you're contributing to your learning as well, that you're kind of giving, you know, you're, you're sharing what you know with other people. Um, and I, I, I absolutely think that that is the future. I just don't think it's quite there yet, but I think it's great that at your, at your college it is. I think that that's, sounds fantastic. I'd love to know more about it. I'll come and talk to you afterwards. There's actually a comment come through on, on, uh, on Twitter from Claire Moon. Is she in the room or is she watching at home? Okay, um, uh, it's an interesting point. She says that um, she kind of quoted something I think that you said, Chris, about uh, teens are more uh, altruistic in today's society than before. And kind of following on from that question about education, do you think that Facebook has a place in educating people on more cause-related activities? Um, yeah, Facebook's own CSR sort of spend or interest is in job creation. So that can cover you know, there's a huge amount of volunteering can come under that and a huge amount of other benefits. Um, but otherwise, they would always claim essentially to be a platform for the use of other people to best use. And so it's, it's up to charities and voluntary organizations to, to employ the right people to maximize that platform, I think. Yeah, question. Hello, do you think social media is still very much reliant on traditional media, um, TV, radio, to bring in new customers? Because if you've got a small Facebook following to begin with, do you then have to seek out other forms of media to, get, yeah, to, to drive the traffic to your, your Facebook profile, your Twitter uh, profile, etc.? 
Mark, do you want to have a go at that? I, I guess I think the more, I guess as social media becomes more saturated and you've got a lot of brands from the same industry fighting for your likes, then naturally media money is going to be something that really drives that. So I think, yeah, unfortunately, you could say it's not naturally the most social thing, having to buy people's friendship. But, um, you know, it's all about cut through. And if people are there actively looking for it, then they'll find you. But if they're not, obviously, the natural way f for them to find you is either a friend says, go there. They enter a competition, say, on another website that, you know, tells you to do that or I guess you know they have to find it by a, an ad. Do you think, um, following on from that, do you think um, do you think Nokia in the future would ever launch a phone just through social media or do you think there's always a place for traditional media in, in, in these types of things? I guess to a degree I think saying just social media I think just online we, we often if a, if a device isn't to um, is maybe an update to an existing phone or something like that. We don't necessarily go out all guns blazing and put it on TV or in stores. It might just be that actually it gets an announcement on our on our um, Nokia blog, which is Nokia Conversations. So it will get announced there and then through Facebook and actually the, it might be available just online in those moments. So I guess we kind of do it, just depends. You always have those big spikes throughout the year, but if it's one of the kind of smaller ones, then a lot of the time it does happen anyway, really. Chris, with your work with Comic Relief, um, particularly, I guess, they had a very big media spikes. Um, do you think that there's any way that Comic Relief could have done what they did without those big media spikes? Or were they, uh, is it just part and parcel that traditional media is still essential when talking to teens? Yeah, you know, we, we've, there's internet memes, aren't there? And they're massive, and they have no other form of media coverage whatsoever. And so there is success, whether any of those have been, if we're, talking, if we're talking about consumerism and products, whether any of those have actually sold anything, I don't know, but, but that has happened, so you can't say it wouldn't happen, but in terms of anyone, like you said, you wouldn't, Nokia wouldn't, if Nokia can afford TV, they're not going to release a new phone um, only on TV, they would use every other medium, and even though TV's still going to get millions more people in a way, or, or present a fuller picture, so um, I just, you know, it's whatever you can afford or you're good at, and then if you can afford everything, people still use everything. Can I, can I just say yeah, something? Yeah. Um, we did some research um, three years ago um, on play and parenting, and it was done in 25 countries. We talked to over 12,000 um, parents and children about play and what they felt about their parents and how much time their parents had to spend with them. Um, and the whole thing was launched, it was actually done on behalf of IKEA, and the whole thing was launched on Facebook, no other medium at all, um, in those 25 countries, and the response was absolutely immense, and it kind of had a momentum of its own, it just took off and took off, took off, and there were lots of mummy blogs talking about it, um, the media picked it up in every country, and it was incredibly, incredibly successful, and I think that was kind of IKEA presumably because they're Scandinavian and being kind of maybe really have ingrained in their, in their, in their lives um, the internet and social media. But it was absolutely fascinating and that, and that was, that was uh, two years ago, three years ago now. So incredible, incredibly effective. I have a question. Um, a couple of you talked about, um, both uh, Mark and Chris, you spoke about um, it's all very instant gratification now. It's about that kind of quick snap, snapshot conversation. Um, what is, what's the ramifications of that as far as losing that longer conversation? So particularly for a mobile phone where you want to, it's not just about being cool, you need to sell them the functions of the phone and what it does and, and that involves a longer conversation. Is it now just all brand, brand, brand? Or is there, how do you start bringing in conversations like, this is what the phone does, and this is how it works, and these are the kind of broader benefits? Yeah, I think it's quite different when you work in the agency world versus when you go in-house. So I, I started off agency side, and you have, yeah, I guess you're, you're kind of set up to go make something quite famous, and then you almost move on to the next one. Whereas obviously when you move in-house and you're working for a brand, you obviously realize you have the business implications of, you know, am I doing a brand job or am I selling stuff? You know, and it's kind of, you can do both effectively, but obviously the, you know, the things that keep people in jobs and keep 
brands going is actually selling things. So, you know, it's quite easy to take your eye off that and say, you know, we're just going to make this famous. But ultimately, if you're not selling the products that keeps you in your job and keeps the whole machine going, then obviously you're technically not doing your job. So I think it's, you know, it's hard to find that balance. But I think ultimately you've got to really assess things on that level. And in terms of creating the content to do that, then obviously, you know, I can look at, say, the Dead Mouse as an example where that was very much about getting the device up there and famous, but we created a piece of content that we managed to get the phone in there and obviously then link out and have people with on our presences to get them to look and inquire about the device. I think you need to, you do need to spark that interest initially to get them going, but obviously it's then having the content and the messages presented to them in a way when they get to say your website or the, the, the other channels such as Facebook to see it that actually they're, they're still seeing the same you know cool thing because if they get there and it's quite boring and corporate coming come from you know dead mouse and big 40 projections and they're probably going to say mm, you know is this the right place for me but obviously it's about continuing that process and the, I guess a long term of a campaign that it's not just a flash just to give you three a heads up I'm going to come to you in a minute with a top three uh, ways of engaging with teams just as a, as a roundup. Any other questions from the floor? Hi, I just wondered if you guys had any advice, and um, this is maybe a bit more for you, Chris, about um, charities and organisations working with young people where engagement could be a risk to confidentiality or a, a particularly sensitive issue. Um. Yeah, it's a massive question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not need, it's obviously, it shouldn't happen on Facebook, and, and you need to give a, a private way of communication to happen. Um, I, I was a Samaritan for a, a long while, and that moved on to email. Um, and then, in fact, the answers were done by anybody under one name. Right? So, even, so it was confidential, and you could, be, you could join in a question or join in a conversation that had previously been answered by someone else, another Samaritan. Um, so it was completely confidential from both sides and even internally within the Samaritans. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, the, but yeah. there's obviously confidential issues that need discussing confidentially, whether social media has a part to play in that, I don't know. Um, any other questions? I know we've got to, got to get in the, the wrap up signal. Um, okay, I'm going to hit you with that question. I'm going to start with you, Barbie, oh, if that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Top three um, ways to, to talk to engage with, with teens. Right, I think, um, remember they are young. They're kids. Remember they're quite vulnerable. Um, and remember that we, as adults, grown-ups, need to be protecting them. So I think, the first of all, would be that sound like LEG, keep it real, because I think you can't hide away from things online. So, you know, if something goes wrong, put your hand up and say sorry, you know, create things that are real that people can, you know, believe, buy into, trust, want to share. Um, and obviously, you know, be honest because it, they can see straight through you if not. Um, secondly, I would, I guess, try and put yourself in their shoes. So it's quite easy to sit there in an office when you're 30 with a budget and say, this is what I think teenagers would do. But obviously, the fact is, you've got a huge resource out there in the internet to go and actually do your homework very quickly and easily. Um, and I think probably lastly, treat them like adults because they spend the whole time when you're a kid wanting to be an adult. So I think if you can speak to them in a language that they don't feel they're spoken down to, then I'm sure you're doing something right. Uh, I just, as a company or charity, I'd just say get a massive campaign on Facebook and uh, just do the right messaging. And as a parent, I would say, uh, threaten to say, I want to know what your password is because you've been naughty. That will get their attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.